same as what they have been in previous years. So hopefully the financial impact will not be too great. Thank you very much. That then brings us to our next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 8079 in the name of Maureen Watt on the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee's inquiry into community transport. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Maureen Watt to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the committee. You have 14 minutes, Ms Watt. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee welcomes the opportunity to debate its report on community transport and its recommendations to the Scottish Government. Could I ask you, sorry, to move your microphone round slightly? Thank you very much. First and foremost, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the stakeholders who submitted written evidence, helped facilitate our fact-finding trips and gave oral evidence to the committee over the course of its inquiry and also to the committee staff and to comms because social media played uh, an interesting part in this inquiry. The inquiry and report would not have been possible without the significant time, input and effort made by community transport groups, representative organisations and service users. The committee hopes that this report will go some way toward highlighting the good work undertaken by these community transport operators in providing a vital service to communities across Scotland. I would also like to thank our colleagues in the Health and Sport and the Rural and Affairs and Climate Change and Environment Committees for their interest and participation in this inquiry. In particular, the Health and Sport Committee's evidence session on transport for health was very helpful in informing the uh, committee's uh, considerations. The purpose of co community transport is the provision of safe, accessible, cost-effective, flexible transport for those who are unable to access or use public transport or private transport. It, provi it is provided by several different types of organisation, for example, dedicated community transport providers, community groups and private individuals using their own vehicles. What we learn is that no two organisations are the same and there is a mixture of voluntary and paid staff to meet the specific needs in a local area. However, early on in the inquiry, the committee identified a number of key barriers and issues many community transport providers have in common, which significantly impact on their ability to provide their services. These are funding arrangements, driver training and licensing, joint working with partnership organisations, leadership and a lack of definitive information and data on the provision of community transport across the whole of Scotland. The committee made a number of recommendations to the Scottish Government and I'm pleased that the Minister of Transport and Veterans in evidence indicated that he would consider these carefully. Indeed, in its response to the committee, the Scottish Government has said that it will be looking into ways to scope out the practicalities of and take forward some of the committee's recommendations. I believe that it is vitally important to address these issues now, as given Scotland's ageing population, this will inevitably, inevitably lead to an increasing requirement for and reliance on community transport services. Getting it right now could have enormous benefits for the population of Scotland in the future. It will, of course, be of no surprise that the funding arrangements for community transport emerged during our inquiry as the single biggest problem facing operators. The committee heard that following the transfer of funding responsibility to local authorities under the Concordat, the level of funding provided to community transport groups from local authorities varies significantly across Scotland. The committee was concerned that this could lead to additional funding financial pressures, particularly around capital funding being placed on community transport operators in those areas where the local authority funding is either lower than that previously available under uh, previous funding schemes or is not provided at all. Although we acknowledge that decisions on their spending priorities are matters wholly for local authorities, we are of the view that the variation in the availability of funding for community transport across Scotland presents significant financial challenges to many operators, which in turn can impact on the service provision to users. The committee called on the Scottish Government to explore the potential for the provision of funding to further assist the community transport sector. 
that this should be explored and particularly in relation to the capital costs of new and replacement vehicles. <clears throat> we are pleased that the Scottish Government noted in its response that they are considering the possibility of a grant scheme to fund new vehicles and welcomes any steps which can be taken toward alleviating the significant burden on providers. And I would very much welcome an update from the Minister on how the Government's consideration of this important matter is progressing. The committee heard during evidence a range of views on whether a more coordinated approach for community transport in Scotland was required, with some responders arguing that such an approach would be beneficial in overcoming some of the barriers experienced by providers. However, other witnesses were keen to emphasise the importance of community need responsive service. The committee agreed that community providers were better equipped to understand local, and local needs, but was of the view that they could benefit from a higher level of support and advice at national level. And in its response, the Scottish Government supported the committee's view. The committee recommended that the Community Transport Association in Scotland would be well placed to take on an expanded role in Scotland, providing leadership and promoting shared standards across the sector, and calls on the Scottish Government to work with the CTA in Scotland to this end. Again, the Scottish Government responded that it will continue to work and support the Community Transport Association to strengthen the services which it can provide to support and encourage community transport initiatives. The Scottish Government also noted in its response that the CTA have been invited to submit costed proposals for an expanded, enroll, expanded role. The committee is obviously very pleased to hear this. A recommendation um, uh, is in process of, and that it's in the process of being explored and options evaluated. The Scottish Government also agreed, I think, to explore how existing approaches such as the CTA's Quality Mark and the West of Scotland Community Transport Network can be developed further to support groups across Scotland and to help drive up standards. We welcome this news as a committee and believe that the development and adoption of common standards across Scotland will benefit operators, users and funders. We were also struck during our inquiry by how, just how little comprehensive information is available about the community transport sector in Scotland. And the consequence of this lack of information is that it's hard to establish where gaps in provision exist and what what is and where is the unmet need and how to plan for future needs. It's also hard to establish beyond an anecdotal level what the additional benefits of community transport are, elements of which the report sought to highlight. Again, the Scottish Government stated that it proposes to commission a new piece of qualitative research to collect information from a selection of community transport providers in Scotland on their service services, including benefits and costs, and deepening the understanding of what services are currently available, and we welcome this commitment. Another significant long-term challenge for community transport sector providers, and which is already starting to be felt, is the impact of minibus licensing changes. In short, the challenges come from the costs associated with training volunteers for their D1 licence the cost of which can be significant and burdensome, especially for small providers. Over the course of the inquiry, the committee suggested that there might be scope for cost saving by more effective coordination of training with larger and smaller services working together. And to this end, the committee recommended that training co coordination be looked at in the context of developing a wider means of supporting the community, trans community transport uh, across Scotland. Another significant theme of the inquiry was the, call for uh, call, was the call in evidence for greater joint working between agent agencies providing transport, particularly for health. As many of you will know, this, this is a call which was made in the Audit Scotland report on transport for healthcare a recommendation from the Scottish Government's own Short Life Working Group on Patient Transport and echoed in the Health and Sport Committee's report to the Infrastructure Committee. The Scottish Government responded to this um, that it will continue to work with regional transport partnerships 
but I look forward to, perhaps to Duncan McNeill and his contribution to expanding on that. Briefly, uh, Presiding Officer, I'd like to mention community transport, uh, concessionary travel that, of course, um, did feature in our, our deliberations. Um, and the committee um, concluded that due to the significant logistical issues of extending uh, the NCT infrastructure to all CT schemes, including SCAR, car, car schemes, and the potentially extremely high financial costs of this was not um, an, op an option. But we did recommend that the Scottish Government explore ways in which to address these uh, iniquities in terms of community transport provision. In conclusion, presiding officer, the importance of community transport in the lives of those who depend upon it should not be underestimated, and nor should the invaluable contribution of those who volunteer and work in the community sector. It is vital that these lifeline services are able to develop and grow, and importantly be sustained as we work towards making Scotland a fairer and healthier society for all. Presiding officer, I hope that the Parliament finds our report both informative and interesting, and I look forward to the contrib contributions this afternoon from, from members. Thank you. Many thanks. I should have said we have some time in hand for the debate, so uh, interventions can be reimbursed. Time for interventions. And I now call on Keith Brown. Minister, you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, first of all, can I say that I welcome the work that's been undertaken by uh, Maureen Watt and her colleagues on the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee into Community Transport in Scotland. And as I stated in my response to the committee in September, the report is an important piece of work on a significant transport sector that does not always receive the recognition it deserves. And I think I hope to be able to demonstrate that they, even in the terms of the government's response, the report has already had an effect on the sector. As a government, we have invested over £8.3 billion in transport since 2007, and that's the largest transport investment programme Scotland has ever seen. And in difficult economic times, and despite Westminster budget cuts, we have managed to sustain direct central government spending on bus services, which account for around 80% or so of all journeys by public transport, at around £250 million a year in cash terms. And that's on top, of course, of the considerable funds that come via the local authority funding settlement. It, nevertheless, as the committee identified, it is a fact that public transport is easier and more affordable to access for some areas and for some groups than others. And community transport has a significant role to play in addressing some of the needs for which conventional services are less well suited. As members will be aware, funding of community transport was devolved to local authorities following the Concordat with the Scottish Government. Uh, this is the right approach as councils have a better understanding of transport needs in their areas and these needs are not the same throughout Scotland. And despite the dramatic reductions in public spending imposed by the UK Government, to which I have already referred, we have maintained the revenue funding available to local government. Between 2007 and 2008 and 2012-13, the resources available to Scottish Government from Dell and non-domestic rates increased by 6.4%. Over the same period, local government's budget increased by 8.9%, and it's this budget which provides the resources to enable local authorities to support community transport provision in their areas. As well as maintaining overall funding, both direct and through the budgets which we make available to local authorities, the government has also made a number of changes which are benefiting many organisations in this sector. For example, last year we changed the rules on bus registration, which allow demand responsive transport services available to the general public to qualify for concessionary travel and for the bus service operators grant. At the same time that changes were made to BSOG in order to calculate the grant based on distance travelled rather than on fuel used. And I know from discussions with operators themselves that this change has been of benefit, especially to many rural bus operators, including eligible community transport operators. For example, Buck and Dyla Community Buses written evidence to the committee said the changes to BSOG had made a vital difference, a vital difference to community transport operators, especially those in rural areas, and supported the services a great deal. Now, despite these policies and changes, we know that community transport faces uh, a difficult time. Yeah, I'd like to add my thanks to all those who contributed to the inquiry, both orally and in writing, and who brought into sharp relief the problems faced by the sector in the current economic climate. 
Uh, and I think everyone in this chamber, certainly from previous debates that we've had on this subject, uh, recognises the important role community transport services play as part of the transport network in Scotland. And we all admire and appreciate the dedicated volunteers who very often give freely of their time and effort to organisations in their local communities. Uh, this is done for no financial gain and sometimes over many years because it's the right thing to do. I was talking to somebody recently who had contracted cancer and who, although a driver herself uh, and her husband was a driver, but he also had health conditions, was unable to get to the Beetson uh, under her own steam uh, on a couple of occasions and was offered the support of a community transport provider to get uh, to and from the Beetson. And that included hanging around for a number of hours in Glasgow whilst the treatment was administered. And it was absolutely vital to that uh, individual. And that's just one example of what these providers often do. That exemplifies the fact that in providing the service that they do, they're helping people who might otherwise be excluded uh, from playing a, a bigger part in the community as well. This uh, provision of uh, support helps support independence, uh, a more active lifestyle, and it encourages less reliance on social and health services. If I could say a few words, President Officer, about the Government's response to the Committee's report. Uh, first of all, I'm well aware, as has been mentioned by the convener, of the number of calls most recently uh, in relation to Age Scotland's Still Waiting campaign for all community transport services to be included in the National Concessionary Travel Scheme. And I know that many members in the Chamber today have written to me on behalf of constituents in relation to this. As we've heard, though, the committee acknowledged the logistical and administrative difficulties that extension of the scheme to include all community transport projects would present. And they concluded, I think rightly, that this would not be the best way forward. As I say, the government agrees with that conclusion for a number of reasons. Uh, certainly. Roger Campbell. Could we have Mr Campbell's microphone, please? Yeah, Thank you. I don't know whether the Minister has seen the briefing from Inclusion Scotland and the position of disabled people, but does, he, does the Government have a view on their position and whether that might be a breach of the Equality Act? Minister. Uh, well, can I say, first of all, in relation to the, uh, uh, the eligibility of people for these services, and especially for concessionary travel, uh, which does cover, in many other circumstances, the ability of people with disabilities to access bus services. Uh, that this, uh, there, there are a number of reasons why we thought it necessary not to uh, progress with that. Uh, on the specific question uh, that uh, Rod has, uh, has asked, uh, I'm happy to look into the question of whether, he, uh, whether it's true that breaches the Disabilities Act. I think it's fairly safe to say the government doesn't believe that because uh, we wouldn't support that, obviously. But the government does recognise the fact that uh, the extension of the scheme in the way that's been suggested by those that have made these representations would include uh, all community transport projects. It wouldn't be the best way forward, for, first of all, because of the costs. Again, Maureen Watts mentioned this. The cost of extending the scheme would increase costs as best we can guess at this stage by around £11.2 million pounds a year. But we do suspect that this figure may be substantially higher. Uh, we don't, for instance, currently know how many community transport organisations are operating in Scotland. And additionally, the figure, the figure of £11.2 million, pounds, which I mentioned, doesn't include the cost of back office equipment and electronic ticket machines needed to participate in the scheme. And of course, that's problematic if you think that some of these services are provided by cars rather than buses as well. So the, certainly. David Stewart. Would the member appreciate, though, that there is a postcode lottery as far as community transport is concerned? In some parts of my patch in Hans and Islands, there's very little official bus transport and community transport is the answer. Therefore, there is an unfairness in rural areas about this approach. Minister. Can I say, I think I've already acknowledged the fact that it is uneven across the country and the government doesn't control this. It's by its nature very often provided by uh, voluntary organisations. So we can't insist on it being uh, level across the country. We can do what we can to try and make sure the gaps are filled. I'm not sure if what has just been said is a plea for the introduction of concessionary travel for these services, but uh, we don't agree that's the right way to go forward for the reasons which I've mentioned. Uh, uh, the, the figure, as I said, doesn't include the back office costs, which can be substantial. And again, if you have a car which you're providing these services from, how you would include the electronic ticket machines is difficult. And if you don't do that, you can't have the audit process that's necessary to make sure the scheme is not being abused, which we have to do elsewhere. And also the national scheme for older and disabled people is primarily for free bus travel uh, throughout Scotland. 
Community transport uh, covers many different modes, as I've mentioned, including cars. It estimates the, the CTA's 2012 State of the Sector report estimates that two-thirds of vehicles used in Scotland's community transport sector, in fact, are cars. And finally, the current scheme offers a rate of reimbursement to operators of around 60% in 2013-14. That will fall to 58.1% in the next year. Uh, but Age Scotland are asking for 100% reimbursement for community transport operators. And it's not clear how that could be accommodated in practical terms uh, within the same scheme. Uh, what we will do, uh, we are very clear that the committee's report uh, in relation to uh, the increasingly difficult uh, operational environment carries some uh, demands of Scottish Government, demand for the services as well as also going up from an ageing population, which is likely, of course, to increase. And there does have to be some creative thinking on how we can further help the sector. The committee has made a number of recommendations, uh, including those to the Scottish Government, and it's my intention to provide practical help in the following ways. Firstly, Transport Scotland is doubling its funding from next month for the Community Transport Association. Now, that will allow the CTA to enhance and expand its work in the community transport sector, one of the very specific asks of the committee in its report. And that additional funding will also enable CTA to build on their State of the Sector report on 20, uh, for 2012, which has probably been the most extensive research undertaken on this subject to date. Uh, the CTA report surveyed 80 uh, of the largest community transport groups and estimated that there were at least 100 additional organisations in Scotland. However, as I've already said, it's a fact that we don't know how many community transport organisations are currently operating in Scotland and this new research will obtain a more comprehensive picture of the community transport sector in Scotland uh, than we've had before and this in turn will give us a better idea of the requirements of the sector as a whole and make it much easier to target help where it's needed and with that additional funding CTA will also be able to increase the level of, of advice and support which it provides to the sector uh, not least by extending its CT online portal to Scotland. It will also offer better service information and direct links uh, to the community. In relation to the point about D1 licences, the issue was raised in the committee's report. We will continue to look at options for securing D1 licence driver training more efficiently. We've already spoken through Transport Scotland to the CTA, Department for Transport and local authorities who also need qualified minibus drivers and will continue to seek ways to address the issue without compromising safety standards. Uh, funding for vehicles was also mentioned and I recognise it's one of the main difficulties for community transport providers. Uh, we are considering very positively what we can do in this area. There are two issues. First of all, to identify the resources in very difficult times and secondly, to make sure we can have the process right uh, for a grant system. Uh, but we are looking at that and expect to come back with a conclusion very shortly. Uh, we also have the Bus Investment Fund, which was launched in April 2013 to provide opportunities for local transport authorities and others to bid for resources to deliver bus-related projects. Uh, and community transport organisations have made a number of interesting applications to the fund in its first year, uh, the results of which will be announced very soon. I anticipate that some of those will be successful, and I look forward to continuing engagement from the sector in future rounds. So in conclusion, presiding officer, there are obviously no quick fixes to the problems faced by community transport groups in Scotland today. However, I do trust that the measures which I've outlined today demonstrate the Scottish Government's commitment to continuing support for the sector, as I think was evidenced in a response to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I now call in Mark Griffin, and you have seven minutes. Thank you, President Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to participate in today's important debate on community transport in Scotland. And while I wasn't a member of the committee at the time, I would like to echo the comments made by Maureen Watt in thanking the committee clerks and all of the organisations and individuals who provided evidence to the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee on this subject over the course of the past nine months. Community transport services play a crucial role across Scotland from rural villages to urban hubs. It's invaluable to those who use it, from going shopping to get to a hospital appointment on time, going to visit friends and family or participating in a social activity. For many, it's their only means of travel. Community transport comes in various forms, from community, scar community car schemes to the well-known MyBus service that operates within SPT, and contractual services such as home to school travel. The role of community transport is particularly important for Scotland's elderly population and the disabled, with more than 80% of the entire user base falling into those categories. 
that is why it is vitally important that we do all we can to encourage sustainable investment in community transport going forward. There are over 1 million people in Scotland currently over the age of 65. And statistics show that by 2016 this figure will have increased by 21 per cent and by 62 per cent by 2031. The over 85 population is expected to have increased by 38 per cent by 2016 and by 144 per cent by the year 2031. Those stats uh, provided by the Scottish Government are stark and with that ageing population and the significant spike in the number of people who will very likely rely on community transport services in the future. It is vital that action is taken to support older people within their communities as much as possible. Community transport relies heavily on dedicated volunteers who play a, a pivotal role in providing the service within communities. In fact, organisations highlighted whilst giving evidence to the committee that many, many of them are completely or almost completely volunteer based. That shows the, the incredible dedication of those volunteers willing to do all they can within our communities. And, it, and it's up to, to local and central government um, to, to try and sustain that level of volunteer activity by removing barriers and offering encouragement. And one of those barriers has been mentioned earlier, and that's around the issue of licensing. Now, I personally, personally got my driver's license well after 1997, as I'm sure many members in the chamber here today did also. And so, <laughs> so like, me, like me, similarly, they won't automatically have the entitlement to, to drive a minibus for a commercial purpose. Um, and that's one of the, the, the big barriers uh, which are facing a new generation of, of volunteers who want to support um, elderly and disabled people in their community. And I, I'm glad to hear the, the Minister talk about overcoming that barrier. While I welcome that vital role played by those volunteers, it, it does raise a fundamental concern, and that is the degree of unpredictability that can, in, that can exist within the voluntary sector and a, a distinct lack of cohesiveness that, that exists between local authority areas when it comes to, to service provision. It's concerning that there's a, a considerable degree of difference across the 32 local authorities in this issue. Um, the financial support dedicated to community transport in North Lanarkshire will be different to the support offered in East Lothian and so on. Now, by creating that postcode lottery, the opportunities for those using community transport will be very different depending on where they live. However, I certainly do have a great deal of sympathy with our councils on this matter who are facing exceptional financial cutbacks as a result of budget decisions in this parliament. And they are being forced to make incredibly difficult spending decisions and prioritise um, in areas which perhaps aren't community transport. And that variation between local authority is, is discouraging, certainly. Minister. I wonder if it's just possible for Mark Griffin to clarify what he's driving at here. Is he against the idea that we have taken away the ring fencing for this funding? Or is he arguing against the fact that the cuts that we've uh, had imposed upon us in this parliament have been less than the cuts as I've demonstrated when I spoke than we have inflicted, had to inflict on local government? We've had a larger increase in funding for local government than we have for uh, the Scottish government. Is he suggesting we should get rid of uh, or bring back ring fencing as it used to be? And does he have the council support for that position? Mark Griffin. There's, there's no need for ring fencing if local government is properly resourced. The, Local government settlement as a proportion of this government's budget has fallen from its peak continually under, under this government. Um, the, share, the share of local government funding as a proportion of the rest of the Scottish government's budget has, has continually fallen and that, is, that I don't believe is, is disputed by any government minister. It, it, it's clear that those funding streams to community transport organisations offered more support prior to the government's concordat with local authorities. The Community Transport Association made clear to the committee that between 1998 and 2008, 
due to central government investment, there were two funding pots that saw considerable growth in community transport across Scotland. What we have seen since that ended in 2008, however, is a sizable reduction in community transport initiatives. Now, that reduction in, in funding, not necessarily related to the removal of ring fencing and the rise in costs, clearly hampers the ability of existing community transport organisations to provide an effective service and acts as a barrier to new organisations being established. Examples of this relate to the renewal of bus and other types of accessible transport. Vehicle replacement is key to many organisations providing an effective, comfortable and safe service within our communities, but many find it difficult to source funding for fleet upgrades. With the financial pressure facing local authorities, it is important that the Scottish Government can contribute and offer what support it can to community transport organisations when it comes to fleet renewal. And at one of the events we had in the Scottish Parliament after the report was published, one of the comments from one of the operators uh, was around procurement and whether local authority buying power and the Scottish Government buying power could come together to assist in, in really pushing down the costs on, on fleet renewal. Presiding officer, 100,000 people in Scotland use community transport. With an ageing population, this figure will rise substantially over the years ahead. And yes, uh, councils should do more and do all they can to ensure our constituents get an effective local service. But the fact is, councils are really struggling to provide even the core service that people are relying on. And it's important that the Scottish Government does more, in particular when it comes to fleet replacement, to assist those organisations that carry out tremendous work many of them on a voluntary basis across the length and breadth of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to now call in Alex Johnson, seven minutes. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Prior to this inquiry, I thought I knew a bit about community transport. The first thing I learned as a result of this inquiry was how little I did actually know. I learned a very great deal during the process. Community transport means different things in different areas, and it means different things to different people. The truth is that there's an enormous diversity of provision, and it can mean anything from a single volunteer who's willing to give up their time and their car to give somebody a lift to a hospital or another appointment, right up to the uh, voluntary sector organisations that are run like professional bus companies. And we came across a number of them during the course of our inquiry. In fact, the standards of professionalism in the voluntary sector in community transport is something that I would like to commend, and I think we should all take the opportunity to do so today. However, the sector is not without its problems. And these were the things that we were able to dig up during the course of this inquiry. And the, the problems are actually fairly easy to define. One thing that we repeatedly uh, came across were references back to the Community Transport Associations of Scotland and the fact that that organisation appears to have had its budget restricted and its staffing restricted. It was repeatedly named as one of the organisations which were best able to give advice and support to voluntary organisations providing community transport, and yet concern was there that one key member of staff had recently had to be put on a part-time contract and consequently couldn't be contacted as often as once they were. That kind of support is something that we need to consider providing more of. It wouldn't take much resource to give that continuous referral point to which uh, hard-working and keen volunteers could get back to to understand what it is they have to do to ensure that the transport system they provide is strengthened. But of course, uh, when we get to the bottom of these issues, funding uh, is always what we find down there. And the issue of funding is and I suspect always will be a contentious one for community transport. First of all, let me deal with the issue of uh, the fact that this has now been devolved to local authorities. It is, of course, always the case that we can deb debate whether local uh, decentralised decision-making is the same as a postcode lottery. Uh, I believe that where we have such a diverse sector in existence, ensuring that local decision-making is in place 
uh, and that local authorities can decide how they fund based on what's actually required is a key element of ensuring that the service provided fits the needs of these communities. I don't believe the one-size-fits-all approach is desirable. Of course, local authorities will have their priorities. And as a result, we see some local authorities being able to deliver what they want in relation to community transport, while others have diverted resources away. That's extremely disappointing to see it happening, but yet I believe at the bottom of this argument is a need to accept that local decision-making must be allowed to take place. Also, when we look at the funding issue, there's the nature of short-term funding. Repeatedly, we were told by people that in an organisation which is only a handful of staff, they might find that uh, one of their staff, or perhaps 20% of the time of an individual staff member, is spent pursuing the funding to keep the service going the following year. So there was a particular aver aversion to the single year funding arrangements which appear to be in place over so much of Scotland. The other funding uh, issue that was mentioned to us over and over again was the problem of capital funding for replacement vehicles. Now that's a problem that gets worse because the cost of vehicles is rising quickly, quicker than perhaps than inflation would suggest it should because the standard of these vehicles is increasing and consequently the cost of maintaining them is increasing too. So I believe it's essential and I welcome the fact that I believe the government has acknowledged there is a problem in that area and that it must be addressed uh, in future. Moving on from that uh, particular problem of finance is the issue of the support that's given to individuals and the suggestion made by Age Scotland in the Still Waiting campaign that concessionary travel should be extended to, uh, the, to community transport. I, in fact, accept everything the Minister said, that there is a mismatch in the suggestion that the, com the uh, community transport can benefit from concessionary travel. But I disagree uh, with the Minister's position that there is nothing we can do. And perhaps here is the one area which I will diametrically oppose the position taken by the government here uh, and on previous occasions. I believe that the problem we have with bus funding in Scotland is a dogmatic pursuit of a no-change policy to the concessionary travel scheme. I believe that the introduction of the Green Bus Initiative and the changes to the Bus Service Operators Grant were, con uh, were constructive, positive and desirable. But the starvation of funds that has taken place as a result of the determination to maintain without change the concessionary travel scheme is the elephant in the room as far as all bus transport funding is concerned. Let me repeat what I've said previously. I believe that it is the right thing for us to do to align concessionary travel entitlement to pensionable age. And by doing so, we can free up enough resource to consider doing something serious about delivering free transport through the community transport organisations. Only by taking that route can we give ourselves the opportunity to deliver the kind of support that these organisations need. So I believe that we should promote diversity and not restrict it. I don't believe that the one-size-fits-all approach will ever deliver in community transport. I believe that we need a scheme in place to support organisations to replace uh, their buses when necessary. I believe that the Community Transport Association Scotland is a valuable resource and one which we can underpin at a very limited cost. And finally, I believe that we do need to continue to support across the board the training that is necessary for those people who do not have that D1 entitlement. As we mentioned earlier, anyone who passed their test after 1997 does not have it. And of course, uh, the number of people volunteering to drive minibuses uh, in their early 20s is limited. I'm worried that we've now got to the point where drivers in their 30s do not have this entitlement. And they are the ones who are the volunteers. I believe that by doing the right thing, 
and giving that training or supporting that training where necessary, we can underpin a renaissance in community transport. The one if fear I that I should address please. is that some people worry if we give young drivers training, they might just go off and get themselves a job. Well, I think that's a risk we've got to take. And if any young person finds a job as a result of training provided in this manner, then I'll be delighted. Good. Right. Thank you very much. Now Colin Duncan McNeill to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Six minutes earlier Sa by Mr thank McNeill. You, thank you. Um, could I put on record my thanks to the presiding officer for ensuring that I'm able to speak in this, this debate on behalf of the Health and Sports Committee. Um, Bums on seats, Deputy Presiding Officer, as that's what counts. More bums and more seats, more often, more flexibly and more, and more cost effectively. That's what Highland Council, uh, Highland Council told the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee during its inquiry. Highland aimed to pull National Health Service vehicles, ambulance service vehicles, school buses um, uh, and other community transport. And, and indeed, it's catching on in, in a seminar um, that we organised in Inverclyde, which uh, the Minister's officials uh, uh, attended. We, we, one of the outcomes of that was to discuss how, bet, how best we could use our community resources, and a pilot hopefully is on its way. And th these, are, these are good local initiatives that uh, we in the Health Committee uh, wish to see uh, extended nationwide. I want to thank uh, my fellow convener, Maureen Watt, and her uh, ICI colleagues for inviting us to input to their work. We were pleased to make a, a modest contribution, but one I hope might encourage more integra a more integrated approach and shift us uh, from what Voluntary Action Scotland saw as a patchwork quilt of arrangements that can be developed locally. As well as VAS, we, we took evidence from NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, the Scottish Ambulance Service, the British Red Cross and the Royal Voluntary Service. We were aware also of the Scottish Government's short-term, uh, short-life working group on, the, on delivery of effective patient transport to health care service. The group didn't report for us uh, 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 in, in time for us to reflect the work, but I detect themes similar to those suggested by our witnesses, similar also uh, to Audit Scotland's 2011 report, the findings of which were, if I can recap, inequity of access, poor integration, lack of leadership and planning, and poor recording of data and spend. We addressed our own scrutiny under three headings, coordination costs and issues for remote and rural communities. I shall touch on each of them, each of them in turn, presiding officer. Audit Scotland's report stated that transport should be an in integral part of care planning and coordination. However, the tone of the evidence we heard suggested this is still a mo more about an aspiration uh, than reality. The Royal Voluntary Service said it needs to be built into the system that th th the systems that are being created for health and social care integration. An, initi an initiative to improve PTS, that's the patient transport system, was highlighted by the Scottish Ambulance Service, that's the SAS. After a recent speech on new medicines, Jackson Carlow uh, uh, say, uh, said, uh, I came close to drowning in alphabet soup, which reminds me of the Yes Minister line, the minister doesn't know his ACAS from his NALGO. <laughs> but, not, but not this minister, though. Um, uh, not that minister. The SAS presiding officer told us about integrated patient transport models in Lochaba, Elgin and Wigtonshire. We recognise, of course, local variation and circumstances must be taken into account. I think that's already been referred to. But, it, but isn't it time now for piloted and proven good practice to be applied more widely? The auditors uh, also found that data on transport costs for health and social care was poor. 
Transport on medical and mobility grounds tends to be funded by the NHS, while transport for those of limited means or living in remote areas is met by councils. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde said a different approach was needed. So far, however, such efforts have not moved beyond small-scale projects. But as the Royal Voluntary Service told us, the costs involved in community transport are actually relatively small compared to the cost of missed appointments. Surely an integrated model for funding patient transport is not beyond the wit of man, woman or short life working group. Yes. Maureen Watt. I, I thank the member for giving way. Um, does he believe that if community transport organisations were involved in community planning partnerships, and especially in the social, health and social care agenda, that much could be done to have a much more joined up uh, framework for providing transport for patients? I mean, I think I'll, I'll refer to maybe later this whole question of leadership, because we hear a lot in my, in my locality and from witnesses about what people can't do. And I ask them, what's preventing you from doing it? And uh, you know, I think if we ask the question differently and involve more people uh, who, are, um, who are actually delivering this service, uh, then, then, then we, can, we, can, we can make, we certainly can make pro progress. Um, and that was a you know, sort of personal departure from the committee line. I'm going to watch uh, what I'm saying here. Uh, our third and final theme was remote and rural communities. SAS has worked with the health board and community transport providers, as I said in uh, Wigtonshire, uh, to pilot a new approach in, uh, involving zoning patients and improving scheduling, increasing, pass uh, uh, increasing passengers and journey numbers. And the ambulance service described it as, a partic as particularly helpful to their thinking about how better to serve patients in, 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 in rural settings. Coordination costs, uh, uh, rural communities, presiding officer, our high hat trick of themes. The worry is that improvement planning of community transport is still being more talked about than practice. Audit Scotland report underlines the significance of leadership and ownership of services, and I want to reinforce that before I put my bottom back on this seat. <laughs> Thank you, Mr McNeill, for stretching the fabric of parliamentary language to the limit. <laughs> we now call on Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. During the evidence session for this report, we heard how important the community transport sector is to many people and communities throughout Scotland. More than 80 per cent of passengers of community transport are older or disabled, and evidence suggests that the service is used by 30,000 individuals and 4,000 community groups, taking over 3.5 million passenger journeys every year. In many cases, this is a lifeline service, and without it, people would remain housebound, unable to access the health care, leisure and social opportunities that they need. However, we were also made aware of the difficult circumstances that they were operating in and the problems created by financial pressures and the difficulty in recruiting volunteer drivers. The key recommendations in the report relate to funding, concessionary fares, driver training, joint working coordination and leadership and information. However, following the stakeholder event in September attended by many organisations involved in community transport, I am of the opinion that the most pressing issues are long-term funding, capital funding and driver training. Funding for community transport was transferred from the Scottish Government to local authorities as part of the 2008 Concordat, as councils are best able to determine the transport needs for their areas. However, the result has been that local authority support for the sector has varied widely, with some councils providing similar funding to previous levels and others reducing funding or reallocating to other areas. One way of immediately assisting community transport operators would be, be, would be to move away from short-term year-to-year funding. A large proportion of staff time is taken up on the annual round of local authority grant applications, as there is no guarantee of continued funding beyond the 12 months, there is difficulty in planning services and retaining key staff, therefore a barrier to growth in the services provided. The Government has indicated in its response to the recommendations that it will work with the third sector to identify any barriers to fuller implementation of the provision of three-year funding. Funding replacement vehicles are a major issue to community transport organisations 
Many vehicles are beyond their economic life, and the constant repairs and maintenance to keep them roadworthy are a drain on their limited resources. Funding was previously available centrally, but again was transferred to local authorities to administer with similar results to revenue funding. The, com the committee felt there was a strong case for a source of capital funding to be introduced to assist in the purchase of new and replacement vehicles. There are currently 300 minibuses operated by third sector organisations operating under the community transport umbrella. And with, on average, a 10-year life, the amount of money required would not be that substantial. However, if a grant scheme was introduced by the government, then two comments from the roundtable event should be borne in mind. Strathclyde Partnership for Transport said that any funds should be for community transport providers, not groups looking for a club bus. And Buck and Dialer Bus highlighted that no one bus meets all our requirements. The other key point from the roundtable event was in relation to driver training, where the issue of a D1 licence was described by SPT as a ticking time bomb. Lothian Community Transport Services told the committee that shortly nobody under 40 will be able to drive a minibus, and this point was emphasised by the Community Transport Association that 90% of respondents are having difficulty recruiting volunteers and that part of the problem could be addressed by increasing the vehicle weight limit. This situation is a result of the European legislation introduced in 1997, which barred anyone without a D1 licence from driving a minibus if the vehicle was more than three and a half tonnes or four and a quarter tonnes with specialist equipment for disabled passengers. The evidence received confirmed that very few vehicles suitable for community transport needs fall into this weight category as a result of the increased weight of wheelchair technology and associated uh, safety measures. The 1997 legislation also introduced a requirement for new drivers to be trained in minibus driving before applying for a D1 licence, which previously was included in the driving licence, provided the vehicle was not being used for commercial purposes. The cost of this training provided by commercial organisations can be up to £1,000 per driver, which is a considerable sum for either the individual or the organisation concerned to find. As the committee heard from LCTS, there are very few drivers with D1 driving entitlement under the age of 33. Traditionally, there have been a lot of young volunteers, but that arrangement is becoming difficult. We are probably just getting to the tipping point at which there will start to be a serious problem. Now, the government does provide support to the community transport sector, including the bus service operators grant to those who provide demand response of transport or registered services. The national sc concession scheme is also open to operators who provide registered local services. So despite the transfer of responsibility to local authorities, the government continues to support the community transport sector. However, if we are to continue to develop and sustain the sector, the government has to consider how it can help resolve the issues I have highlighted as soon as possible of short-term funding, replacement vehicle costs and driver training. Thanks. Many thanks. Now I call on Dr Elaine Murray to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Presiding Officer. And I am pleased to speak in the debate on the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee's report on community transport. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although I am no longer a member of that committee, uh, I, I was at the time, and I therefore echo the thanks to the clerks and the witnesses uh, who uh, came before the committee. Now, I had been aware of the, for many years of the important role of community transport plays in my constituency. I can recall many years ago accompanying Sarah Boyack when she was the Transport Minister early on in the life of this Parliament when she handed over a new minibus to the Annandale Transport Initiative. Many of my constituents, community groups and voluntary organisations in rural Annandale and Nestdale have benefited over the years since through being able to use fully accessible minibuses and other accessible transport in areas where public transport is infrequent and sometimes unavailable altogether. So like Alex Johnson, I thought I knew a fair bit about community transport, but I found during the course of this inquiry there was quite a lot I didn't know. For example, I had mistakenly assumed that community transport was predominantly a rural development. It had been, it, it had been the recent, recent Age Scotland campaign and the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee's inquiry which have made me realise the extent and diversity of community transport provision 
uh, in Scotland. Community transport provides services in cities too for people who are physically unable to use public transport buses, perhaps because the vehicles are not suitable for wheelchair users or because the traveller can't actually get to the bus stop in the first place because there may be no local bus service or the nearest service is too far to get to. Community transport, of course, as others have said, isn't only provided through buses and minibuses. It also includes volunteer dri drivers helping people, for example, to get to hospital appointments or to other visits using their own cars. Some community transport providers are social enterprises, such as the Coalfield Community Transport in Cumnock, which I visited during the committee's inquiry. This is a non-profit distributing company, limited by guarantee, which owns eight minibuses which can be hired. It offers services such as a day hopper club providing excursions and an away hopper service offering short breaks. And it is also contracted by the local council, East Ayrshire, to run some public transport services. So on those uh, under a Section 22 licence, it, it does become eligible for BSOG and the concessionary travel scheme. It is large enough to have paid staff in addition to volunteers. But in contrast, Thornhill Community Transport, which also attended the same event, has one minute bus and it relies completely on volunteers. However, the services of community transport providers, whether large or small, are much valued by their users. But keeping these services function, functioning during times of financial austerity is challenging. Initially, funding was provided by central government through the, through the Rural Community Transport Initiative and the Urban Demand Responsive, Responsive Transport Initiative. These enabled groups such as the Annandale Transport Initiative to purchase fully accessible vehicles. As the Minister described, the Scottish Government transferred the, the, these funding streams to councils without ring, ring fencing as part of the 2008 Concordat with uh, local authorities. Now, some local authorities have remained financially supportive towards their community transport providers, but others, the committee was told, have been less so as they became more financially constrained themselves. And since funding was transferred to local authorities, the growth of the community transport se sector, we were told, has slowed considerably. The vehicles purchased through the RCTI and the UDRT are now ageing and are in need of replacement. The maintenance of older vehicles places a greater financial strain on providers, but for many there is no funding stream which can provide the significant sums required to purchase replacement vehicles, and this issue will increasingly urgently require to be addressed. My local rural community transport providers have made the point to me, and I have raised it with ministers in Parliament over the years, not just with this government, but with its predecessors, that many of their customers are eligible for free bus tra uh, travel, but don't get the opportunity to use their entitlement due to the inavailability of suitable public transport. I was, and indeed am, more sympathetic to Age Scotland's still waiting campaign than some other members of the committee. To me, there is a major issue of inequity. Now, under the current rules uh, of the concessionary travel scheme, at the end of 2014, I will actually be entitled to apply for a bus pass, which would enable me, when staying in Edinburgh, to travel from my flat to Parliament for nothing. Indeed, I do have a D1 entitlement. I could uh, drive a minibus also. But to me, there is something wrong about people like me in 2015 who are in well-paid jobs being able to travel to work for free while others who are far less well off, possibly members of my parents' generation rather than my own, or suffering from limiting disabilities, have to pay for the transport they need to get medical appointments or go to the shops or to have some form of social life because they cannot access public transport to use their entitlement card. Bob Doris. We're listening to the debate with interest. Just for clarity, could you maybe tell me what the Labour Party position is then on the free bus pass? Because I'm unclear from your speech precisely what it is. Dr. The Labour Party brought in the concessionary yeah. travel scheme. We are still supportive of the concessionary travel scheme, but we cannot debate this issue of major inequity, which actually affects a lot of my constituents living in rural Scotland, then we are not, we are not doing our job as parliamentarians. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There are significant problems with simply extending the national concessionary scheme uh, to community transport, and that became evident during the committee's inquiry. For example, funding the extension and the installation of the necessary ticketing infrastructure. The problem with reimbursement is public transport receives 60% of the cost of an adult fare, not the whole cost of the ticket. And there would be even greater problems, as others said, in extending the system to the use of private cars, which also provide community transport under some schemes. So a simple extension of the National Concessionary Transport Scheme appears to be fraught with difficulties. And there may be a better way of achieving the same result. And the result I want to see achieved is equity in the provision of free transport for community transport passengers, particularly those living in rural Scotland, such as my constituents. 
The committee, I have to say, came up with no alternative suggestion, but it suggested that the government should seek a mechanism of addressing inequity. I suppose that's a bit of a cop-out uh, in the context of community transport provision. If it is not possible to include community transport in the NCTS, I urge the government to seek to address this inequity. It has persisted since the introduction of the national community transport uh, uh, system. I have raised it, as I said, with successive ministers close, in please. different uh, administrations on behalf of my older constituents who are not served by accessible public transport. Many thanks. <clears throat> now call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by David Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I too compliment the members of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee on a very interesting and comprehensive report on community transport. Reading it through as a non-member of the committee, I learned a great deal, but it also confirmed many of the issues which constituents uh, involved in community transport have raised with me over the years and which I in turn have raised in the chamber and in correspondence with ministers. The south of Scotland area which I represent is one of the most rural in Scotland and since the beaching cuts of the 1960s has not been well served by the railway network, notwithstanding the Borders, uh, the borders Railway which will um, open in the future. In Dumfries and Galloway, the population is declining faster than in other parts of the country. The age profile of the population is older than average. Wages are considerably lower than average. And in an area where car travel is often the only way to get around, petrol prices are much higher. For this reason, community transport is vital. And it's heartening, though perhaps not surprising, that there are several vibrant community transport organisations in the, the region. I will be speaking at the AGM of one of them tomorrow night, or already mentioned uh, by Elaine Murray, which is the Annandale Transport Initiative, which is based in Lockerbie and serves a very dispersed population in towns and villages such as Annan, Gretna, Moffat, Haiti, and many other very rural communities. It's delivered community transport to Annandale since 1999 and hopes to extend its services to Langham and Eskdale. It has grown from two accessible minibuses to six accessible minibuses and two people carriers. Its service users include 150 registered groups and a number of individual users, and there are 40-plus volunteer drivers who are inspiring in their commitment to Annandale Transport Initiative. And such is the quality of their work that the organisation has achieved in investors and people recognition three times. Last summer, I wrote to ministers on behalf of ATI after they raised two areas of concern with me. First, while they were supported by Dumfries and Galloway Council, which I think, compared to many other local authorities, does have a, a good record in, in this particular area, um, the, the funding decision maker has become the Annandale and Estdale Area Committee and has moved uh, to one-year funding, as has been mentioned by other members, causing considerable problems. Also, ATI asked for my support in gaining access to capital to replace their minibuses. Their vehicles all currently have 180,000 miles on the clock and date back as far as 2003. I've raised both these concerns with ministers and I was heartened to receive a letter from the minister, Keith Brown, in July this year in which he refers to the committee report and in particular its recommendation that the Scottish Government consider a capital funding scheme for the purchase of vehicles which could be developed and introduced. And I welcome his comments today which do give grounds for optimism on that particular front. I note also that the Scottish Government has responded to the committee report and addressed the two major concerns raised by my constituents in Annadale Transport Initiative and by many more, indeed all the local groups who gave evidence to the committee. I'm pleased the Scottish Government response recognises replacement of vehicles as a key issue and I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government officials are working with the third sector to consider how the need to fund new vehicles for community transport might be done. We will hear about the positive outcomes of those talks very soon, I hope. That's certainly the view of Annandale Transport Initiative. When I spoke to their manager recently, it certainly can't come soon enough. She was sitting with six funding applications to charities and foundations as diverse as the Robertson Trust and the People's Postcode Lottery on her desk. And it was mentioned to me that when you have to apply to a diverse range of, of, um, of, uh, of funders for your funding, you have to repeat over and over again what community transport is to people who might not be overly familiar with it. And uh, she was saying to me that it really would be much better if they could apply to a fund 
or people knew the value of what they do and where they were experts um, and uh, were able to assess their application uh, properly. The committee report talked about how time-consuming such grant applications could be for small organisations who also wish to use their limited resources delivering services to local people. Indeed, Annandale, I discovered, had employed a specialist to assist in these applications, and this, of course, had to be paid from its revenue funding. That will eat into money for repairs, but they have little alternative, as the best solution is replacement vehicles. It's a vicious circle. Mechanical failure can be particularly distressing when the service has been used by vulnerable groups, such as those with a disability. I was told of a group who had a very enjoyable night out at the theatre, only to be able to access the wheelchair lift at the end because it got stuck. I welcome the investment in transport outlined by the Minister and uh, note that the record investment of, uh, by this government in transport and the continuation of the concessionary travel has increased the number of bus journeys made in the south of Scotland. And it's all the more impressive that we have continued to invest in transport against the swinging Westminster cuts to Scotland's revenue and capital budget in recent years as outlined by the Minister. With regard to the other main issue raised in the committee report and by my constituents, short-term funding, I welcome comments made by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth in the Chamber on the 1st of May this year, in which he recognised that short-term funding can make it difficult to plan services and create additional costs and cause uncertainty to staff. And I thought some of the evidence in the committee's report about staff receiving redundancy notices on a, a yearly uh, basis was really quite distressing. Uh, Mr Swinney said that the Scottish Government is working with stakeholders to try to move the sector back to a three-year funding package. However, it is a matter of local authorities, as the Scottish Government response makes clear. And I would like to put on record that I think it's very disappointing that some local authorities who, who, who shout loudest about local democracy, uh, when they are given complete freedom to spend their grant on local priorities, they, they perhaps uh, don't give a priority to volunteer-led third sector organisations who are working working in the community, uh, like community transport initiatives, and like I hope to uh, close, that, that that will change going forward. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Now call on David Stewart to be followed by Jim Eady. Six minutes or thereby. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and could I start by congratulating uh, Maureen Watt and the members of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee on their excellent and constructive report on community transport. Uh, Presiding Officer, this is a subject uh, very close to my own heart uh, when I worked for SCVO in 2005 one of my first tasks was to join a Scottish Government working group to advise the then Transport Minister Tavish Scott on the strengths of applications for the Rural Community Transport Initiative. Uh, the fund as members will know was set up by uh, the Labour Liberal Democratic Executive and of course was aimed at rural and remote areas where there's very few or limited uh, bus services. Initially at that time as the Transport Minister will know the budget was around 600,000 per annum. And I remember, uh, presiding officer, when the group used to meet in Victoria Quay every month, I used to arrive weighed down by boxes of application forms from throughout rural Scotland, filled in by the hardworking volunteers from community transport companies, as we know, operating on a shoestring, but united in that single goal of providing a quality service to local communities, to the elderly, to the disabled and disadvantaged. And I would say just for a second, President Officer, the committee would agonise over scoring each application, conscious that not getting it right would mean less community transport in the Highlands, Aberdeenshire and the borders. And could I place on record my appreciation and thanks to all those running community transport across Scotland. But of course, what they do is exhibit the power and strength of the third sector in Scotland, a third sector with deep historical roots. And a century and more ago, when the National Health Service was a mere twinkle in the eye of Nye Bevan's eye. Hospital almoners used to care for the sick, comfort the bereaved, and of course, counsel the dispossessed. They also, presiding officer, had an early version of community transport when they arranged the transport of patients back to their own homes, of course, then by horse and cart. Uh, that work was not carried out through a sense of paternalism or pity. Instead, it was a matter of professionalism and commitment. But as the report says, uh, community transport is much more than moving passengers from A to B. In rural and remote areas, it's a force for good, it's an agent of rural development and a weapon against social isolation. Let me give you one example. Within my own region, in the Highlands and Islands, the award-winning Badenoch and Shusbe Community Transport Company aims to increase its reach into the community by expanding 
where to today community car and transport scheme. And as members will know, Banostra Spey is a widespread rural area where isolation, particularly among the elderly, is a real problem. And I was proud uh, to say, President Officer, that I actually opened the scheme in Granton in 1997 on a beautiful summer afternoon as one of my first tasks as a fresh-faced newly elected MP. Surprising as that description may seem now to members. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, the excellent service is an also benefit to 120 volunteer drivers, most of whom are over 50. And of course, as we've heard from Duncan McNeill, the health spin-off to service users and volunteers is immeasurable. Um, High Transport Sign Officer, the Hans Lance Transport Company, engaged consultants a couple of years ago to review community transport schemes in the Highlands and Islands. And after looking at five case studies, they concluded the cost of replacing community transport initiatives for with commercially managed transport services would be half a million pounds. And in passing, presiding officer, um, I would also flag up Ian Gray's members' bill to change the regulatory framework for buses in Scotland. Um, as members know, this will have implications for community transport. The bill is designed to find more ways of facilitating more accessible bus services through a new franchise power for local authorities, but also allowing ways of allowing more uses of local authorities' own fleets, with the aim of community transport making up the difference. Now, the convener quite rightly pointed out that the, there are serious challenges ahead. There's a decline in public bus transport by 12.5% since 2008. We've all heard about the demographic changes, the increase of over 65-year-olds by 22% by 2020. We've also heard several times from members about the crucial shortage of revenue and capital funding, particularly since we've had the transfer to local authorities. We've also heard about the need for three-year rather than one-year funding periods, a lack of representative baseline information, a lack of national coordinate report, um, approach, and many members have mentioned the huge issue of equity, particularly, I think Elaine Murray mentioned that, and to do with concessionary travel. But as Voluntary Action Scotland have said, and I quote, the networks are disparate in their nature, and they suffer from a lack of coordination to maximise their effectiveness. It's also clear, presiding officer, that some potential users don't know the level and range of services available in local areas. But potential solutions are in the air. And I do welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to examine the possibility of a grant scheme to fund new vehicles. And perhaps in the wind-up, the Minister will provide some more details of this in terms of the timescale for the proposal. Uh, community transport is undoubtedly a huge resource for users, particularly in rural Scotland. By integrating with patient transport and utilising publicly owned vehicles such as school buses, the service can go to the next level for local communities. Community transport is one instrument in the toolbox of building communities delivered by the dedication and professionalism of a dynamic third sector. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Colin Jamidi to be followed by Cameron Buchanan. Six minutes or thereby, uh, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to contribute to this afternoon's debate and to highlight the important contribution as colleagues have done this afternoon, which community transport plays in increasing social inclusion and reducing isolation across Scotland. Mention has been made of the National Concessionary Travel Scheme, and I wish to say a little bit more about that in the course of my own contribution. But can I say at the outset that I am proud that the Scottish Government has safeguarded and funded the scheme and community transport services during its time in office. It is clear, as others have stated, that investment makes a real difference to the lives of thousands of older or disabled people, allowing them to live active, healthy and independent lives. Throughout our inquiry, the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee received extensive written and oral evidence which made that very point, that community transport services are a vital lifeline service for many people and communities across the country. And whether people use them to attend a medical or hospital appointment, a point that was made with some gusto by Duncan McNeill, or whether people use them to travel to a lunch club or other social activity, or simply to go about their normal daily activities such as shopping, community transport services make an invaluable contribution to many people's lives, empowering people to participate in the life of their community, tackling social isolation and loneliness, and contributing to good mental health and a general sense of well-being. These are all tangible benefits of community transport services. The committee recognised the role that these can play in enabling access to health care, leisure and social opportunities which might otherwise be closed to those who need it most. And the committee also recognised that community transport allows many service users to live independently who might otherwise require supported or residential care. 
Now, we need to capture the contribution which community transport services make in financial terms as well as the wider benefits to society. And that is why I welcome the committee's call for a robust assessment of the total positive impact on individuals and communities of community transport provision. And I look forward to further progress in this area. The committee was united, therefore, in celebrating the value of community transport services and in making a series of recommendations, which I am pleased to say the Government has considered and agreed to implement. I would like to pay my own tribute to Lothian Community Transport Services, which operates in three local authority areas. Edinburgh, Midlothian and West Lothian. In Edinburgh, it operates a fleet of eight accessible minibuses that are available for hire with a driver or on a self-drive basis to other voluntary and community organisations. It provides that lifeline service to about 130 different groups. I'd also like to pay tribute, as Mark Griffin has done to the dedication and hard work of volunteers in sustaining our community transport services without their commitment uh, we would struggle uh, for these community services to be viable. I hope that the Government will do more to encourage community transport providers to take advantage of the Voluntary Action Fund, which delivers support on behalf of the Scottish Government to voluntary organisations. I also welcome the further work which is to be undertaken in expanding the role of the Community Transport Association and the doubling of its funding which was announced by the Minister this afternoon. This is not about centralising services. These will quite rightly continue to be funded and delivered at a local level, but it is about providing necessary and valuable support and advice at the national level. And perhaps the issue of grant applications which Joan McAlpine mentioned is one that could be considered uh, as part of that process. Now, some organisations and some members have talked about the merits of extending the National Concessionary Travel Scheme to include all demand-responsive community transport services, but they have not said how that would be paid for. Age Scotland, in its submission, recognised that the cost implications would arise from extending the scheme, which it estimated to be around £11 million, although the Minister um, has said this afternoon that that may well be a gross underestimate, and it has made a specific suggestion about how those costs would be met. The committee received a range of written and oral evidence on the subject as part of its inquiry into community transport. John Macdonald of the Community Transport Association highlighted one of the obstacles that would have to be overcome. In evidence to the committee, he stated, concessionary fares in community transport and Section 19 services could only ever work where there is a fare-paying passenger. There has to be an individual on the bus paying a fare. However, on many services, individuals do not pay fares. However, in discussing the proposal, it is important to recognise that although cost is a barrier and a factor, it is not the only one. Indeed, it would not be the only barrier to the extension of the scheme. A number of witnesses indicated that concessionary fares are not a priority. It has been suggested that the biggest challenge for community transport is an ageing fleet and that investment should be, funded, sorry, should be focused on funding for vehicles. John Moore of Lothian Community Transport Services stated, funding fleet renewal is the biggest challenge that faces my organisation. We have an ageing fleet which is getting more expensive to maintain. When it was suggested that the National Concessionary Scheme is not the right vehicle because of the costs involved, witnesses from a range of organisations replied in unison, yes. The organisations were Lothian Community Transport Services, the Women's Royal Voluntary Service, Badnock and Strathspey Community Transport Company and South West Community Transport. The evidence that our committee received suggested that there were a number of practical and logistical challenges, including introducing ticket machines to read the bus pass, which could cost up to £10,000 in each case, and that there may be more pressing priorities. The committee, therefore, was clear in its conclusion that while it acknowledged that there was an issue of equity a point made effectively by Dr Murray for people in remote and rural communities, it stated that the extension of the concessionary fare scheme would present hugely significant logistical and administrative challenges. The committee recognises that there is no easy or immediate solution to this problem. So the committee preferred to focus on investment in new vehicles, a point that was made by Alec Johnson and Gordon MacDonald in their contributions when they argued for capital funding for replacement vehicles. In conclusion, presiding officer, we should seek to build consensus on the way forward, as the committee has done in the course of its inquiry. We should continue to listen to the providers and users of community transport services in Scotland in order to provide that lifeline service to the many older and disabled people who need it. Many thanks. Now, Colin Cameron McCannon to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. 
And may I begin by welcoming this debate brought forward by the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. There seems to be great agreement amongst everybody about what should be done, but it is important that in this area that is highlighted, but the measure of success will be whether it leads to a comprehensive strategy on improving, trans on improving community transport. Thank you. There's been a lot of discussion today, but little in the way of action, and as the old nursery rate rhyme goes, the bus goes round and round. Many members have already highlighted the area of concern, and to my mind, there are a few key points which need addressed if we're to progress. Firstly, we must have a better idea of what is actually happening, happening within the community transport services on the ground. Submissions to the committee highlighted the lack of information on the current coverage and state of health services, state of health of the services. That said, the consensus is that the community transport is very important in our communities, particularly for those dealing with social isolation, and they cannot therefore access the mainstream bus services. However, we have no idea of just how vital these services are, who is reliant on them, and how they would cope if the service wasn't there. There will also inevitably be groups who would benefit significantly from access to community transport, but are presently missing out. Moreover, these groups may have access to funds and volunteer support which could be brought to support existing community bus and car sharing schemes. Accordingly, a detailed studies or audit of services I think is a must, analysing what services are available, how well used they are, and from there we can progress. The most obvious area for improvement will be the coordination and organisation of existing services. Whilst there will inevitably be gaps in the service, I feel sure that we will also find neighbourhoods where there will be a number of people using different community travel services, so accordingly there must be scope for greater efficiency. There has been criticism about the lack of joined up working and coordination of approach, particularly by Audit Scotland. However, there are also some successes. POLIS, P -O -L -I -S, is a European organisation that works with local authorities and regions to support better transport through improved technology and transport policies. It, it hailed the My Bus service operated by the Strathclyde Passenger Transport as a good example of demand responsive transport, or to you and me, buses that turn up where you want, when you want. My Bus impressed due to, my bus impressed due to its joined up approach and coordinated service, which just shows, goes to show there are already good organisational and management practices out there which we can draw on and share. Moreover, the attention that it is receiving from EU policymakers shows that we are not alone in looking at how the community travel can be used in an overall transport strategy. As I said, the coordination will bring better use of existing resources, but it is clear that there are also significant concerns about the lack of funding and investment in this sector. Indeed, I was struck by the number of submissions that complained about the quality and age of minibuses and the ongoing cost of the D1 licence training, as my colleague uh, said in his statement here. A stark reminder that action is required now as the problem is only getting to get worse has been pointed out by many people. That brings us to the issue of how we fund the community transport sector. I'm sure we would all agree that in principle with Age Scotland's campaign to extend the National Concessionary Travel Scheme to include community transport, and were it that simple enough to do so, then I'm confident we would be going down that path. However, it's not that straightforward. Submissions to the committee highlighted that it would compete unfairly with existing bus services, and money would also have to be found for ticketing machines and software to allow the monitoring of passengers, as the, ministry, as the minister rightly pointed out. Accordingly, I think we have to move aside on this one and actually look at other solutions. The encouraging aspect is that the submissions received by the committee, there were a number of proposals about how we can make things easier for the community transport sector. For example, there was a very practical proposal of the Lothian Community Transport Services within my own region to simplify the application process for a bus service operator grant, which is based on the eligible distance travel and fuel consumed as a result, and which benefits passengers by keeping fares lower. Small, simple ideas, which on their own may not look particularly earth-shattering, as a whole, will make a big difference to the people, many of whom are volunteers who run these services. I was also struck by the suggestion by the City of Edinburgh Council of piloting a buddy system between commercial bus companies and tour operators and community tra transport groups, which we heard, I think, in the Highlands and Islands. The suggestion being that things such as mechanical support could be shared and the cost of purchasing through such companies would be cheaper. Again, this seems worthy of consideration, but it also highlights the potential contribution of commercial operators, something that, to my mind, has been slightly lacking until now. Since these companies are already partners in the NCTS scheme, there may also be an opportunity to use them to ensure that the community transport groups benefit from the funds available. 
The other reason commercial bus companies should form part of the discussion is because this debate is not simply about community transport, its future, but about the contribution it could make to a coherent local transport strategy in our community. So many respondents, the committee noted, demand for community transport services and their design tends to be circumcised to existing bus routes. And I'm not referring either to the blighted trams. I was going to use a profanity there, but I didn't. Accordingly, we should be encouraging, at the very least, a dialogue between the two community transport and mainstream bus route operators, especially where community transport has the potential to drive up overall public transport. Of course, Mr. Presiding, Deputy Presiding Officer, if we're moving towards the community transport, taking on a more strategic role within overall transport planning, we must be prepared to put our money where our mouths are. If these groups are to retain staff and invest in new buses, equipment and staff training, then they need greater certainty about funding. We must address that issue whilst ensuring value for money for the taxpayer and ensuring overall accountability. Deputy Presiding Officer, we've arrived at this debate very much on the back of the campaign to extend the NCTS scheme. Whilst we may have expressed difficulties with this approach, we must not allow it to halt progress. It is clear that there are a number of ways we could make better use of the resources and better community transport groups. Above all else, though, we must have leadership on this issue from the government, and we must identify and implement solutions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Margaret McCullough. Six Thank minutes you. or thereby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate and welcome the committee's report, although obviously I have the disadvantage of not hearing the evidence as it was presented to the committee. I'd like to begin, however, by talking briefly about community transport provision in my own constituency of North East Fife before moving on to the report itself. As others have said today, community transport provision is a lifeline to many people around Scotland, something that many people, particularly in rural areas, depend on to get them from A to B. And it is a service that is of incalculable value to vulnerable people who may not be able to leave their homes anywhere near as much as they would like to without it. In North East Fife, there's only one main publicly funded community transport scheme in place. That's Dial-A-Ride. Members will no doubt be familiar with both the Dial-A-Ride scheme and the Ring and Ride services. Dial-A-Ride is a timetable service which collects passengers from their homes on request and allows people who have difficulties in using standard public transport the opportunity, for example, to do their shopping independently. Passengers simply have to phone the service in advance to request a pickup. Ring a ride, on the other hand, is a door-to-door -door service which is not timetabled and has to be booked in advance. The destination can be anywhere within the local operating area. Sadly, however, the ring and ride <laughs> service in Fife is limited to only four operating areas, Kirkcaldy, Leavenmouth, Dunfermline and Glenrothes, none of which is available to serve many of my constituents to any significant extent, many of whom, of course, live in rural areas such as the East Newk and Howard Fife. While general community transport is not readily available in North East Fife, it's fair to say that the Scottish Ambulance Service's patient transport, where it's available, is very well used by outpatients with mobility issues. And as with so many things, we, as we discussed in this chamber, it's important that we acknowledge the contribution made by volunteers. Their role in community transport initiatives everywhere simply cannot be overlooked. But I'm in no doubt whatsoever that if more general services were available, they would also be used and valued. Presiding officer, it's clear that community transport services are an essential part of the transport infrastructure in places where they exist, and they're an enormous boon to all who can use them. However, it's also clear that the picture across individual local authorities, not to mention across Scotland as a whole, is patchy, as uh, David Stewart has inferred. On that basis, I welcome the committee's report, which makes some helpful recommendations, and I'm pleased that the Scottish Government's response indicates a willingness to take forward a number of those proposals. As others have alluded to, there are a number of issues that stand in the way of extended community transport provision. Perhaps one of the biggest long-term challenges facing Scotland is that of preparing for an ageing population, as the convener Maureen Watt uh, referred to in her opening speech. The committee noted some daunting figures which showed the scale of the challenge, as Mark Griffin and Duncan Neal have already indicated to the Chamber. All I would just simply emphasise is that uh, given the average life expectancy for males in Scotland is 76.6 and 80.9 for females, and taking into consideration slowly but surely improving health, the forecast rise in the number of 85s of 144% in less than 20 years is truly food for thought. It's clear that we are experiencing a major demographic shift which will increase the demand for services such as community transport substantially and it's reassuring to note the Scottish Government fully recognises that and its implications. 
The Committee's report also identified wider issues facing Scotland's infrastructure in general. And if I may, I just want to refer to a few paragraphs. Paragraph 86 stands out. Community transport allows many service users to live independently who might otherwise require supported or residential care. I would therefore hope the Scottish Government not only recognises that, but considers investment in community transport initiatives in the short term to be a major area of preventative spend in the years ahead. I also want to mention the implications of paragraph 87 of the committee's report, which goes right to the heart of the debate, I think. Paragraph 87 reads, the, the committee notes the anecdotal evidence on the reported positive impacts of community transport services upon the lives of users and the wider community. Whilst it considers that these benefits are obvious and clear, the committee, however, acknowledges that there is a significant information gap which makes it impossible to make a robust assessment of the total positive impact on individuals and communities of community transport provision. This theme continues through to paragraph 90, which states that more qualitative information on the operation of community transport services across Scotland uh, might be beneficial. This information gap is, is clearly nobody's fault. It's a natural product of a patchwork system that has grown and evolved over time to meet the changing needs of users. And it means that community transport encompasses many different approaches across the country, as Alec Johnson has already suggested. To use the loosest possible definition of the term, community transport encompasses local authority-run services, such as Dial-A-Ride and Ring-A-Ride, and private limited companies such as MyBus, which operates in North East Fife, and volunteers driving minibuses or using their own cars, patient transport services, transport provided by residential care homes, and many more. I'm sure we all agree that we need a comprehensive system for measuring the effectiveness of all forms of community transport, both public and private and third sector, and its provision should be kept under regular review to, to ensure it's effective. I'm therefore delighted that the Scottish Government has agreed to commission a new piece of qualitative research. That's a very welcome step, and I await the results of that research with interest. Uh, I also welcome uh, the Scottish Government's commitment to continue to work with regional transport partnerships and NHS Scotland to implement the recommendations of the Short Life Working Group on Health Transport. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call on Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Six Thank minutes. you, President Officer. The Committee's inquiry into community transport has brought this Parliament's attention to a well-used and much-needed set of largely voluntary services. I was glad to be part of that inquiry, and I hope that members on all sides of the Chamber will give their fullest consideration to rec recommendations which have been made. The evidence we gathered should help us all understand the difficulties these projects can face, as well as the opportunities they can create, especially for people who might be vulnerable or isolated. In their State of the Sector report from 2012, the Community Transport Association in Scotland found that the organisations they had surveyed, there were at least 25,000 25, volunteers in the sector supporting 280 hours of voluntary service and 3.5 million journeys each year. Not only that, but demand for those services is likely to rise due to the population ageing and a tendency in Scottish Ambulance Service to shed patient transport services and focus on emergency response. Let's be clear, community transport projects are vital and they are, growing, they are of growing importance to Scotland because of our ageing demo demographics and the limitations of commercial bus services. Community transport is a lifeline for people whose transport options can be limited due to age, disability and gaps in provision, especially in rural areas and places not served by public transport. I visited three community transport projects this year while the inquiry was ongoing, one in Duns in Scottish Borders through the ICI committee and two in East Cobride in my own region. It was interesting to see how different projects serving different people had grown and developed, as well as the variety of uses which had been found for the community transport schemes. Over a period of 30 years, East Kilbride Community Transport has become a hugely successful service for local community groups. Their success reflects the passion, their dedication and the good business sense of Ina Cummin and her volunteers. East Kilbride Shop Mobility is making the town centre accessible for all, doing more than just taking people from place to place, but taking them from the front door to the shops and back again. 
In Duns, Berwickshire Wheels is keeping people connected in rural areas. It provides more than just, a, just the chance to go shopping or visit a GP. It's a social lifeline too. One pensioner I spoke to in Duns told me that without Berwickshire Wheels, she couldn't go to the theatre. And so the volunteers and the drivers do more than help her with the essentials. They help her maintain a quality of life. At a time in the Scottish Government, others are emphasising the importance of prevention and early intervention. It is important to appreciate the difference that community transport can make. Helping the elderly, the vulnerable and the isolated maintain an active lifestyle can prevent exclusion and promote wellness and independent living in later life. What those local examples have shown is that community transport schemes are not just a value presence in communities, they are in demand. In light of that rise in demand, I would urge the Scottish Government to consider what further steps we will have to take in future to support these services. If we follow the logic of preventative spending through to its conclusion, then we can expect councils and the NHS to benefit from initiatives which help older people remain active and independent for longer. Comprehensive research into added value from community transport at this stage can help us build a more cost-effective, better resourced set of services for the future. By working with Transport Scotland and the Community Transport Association, we can develop best practice and explore options for joint working and shared booking systems to bring costs down. All that the committee has asked the government to do, and all that I'm asking the government to do, is look at the options being presented to us build up our understanding of the sector and consider how we might resource community transport going forward. Presiding officer, demand for these projects is growing and so we have to make sure that we have the evidence available to us now to make informed decisions about the future of community transport and the needs of these resilient, diverse and increasingly vital services. Thank you. Thank you. Now call on Dennis Robertson, after which we move to the closing speeches. Mr Robertson, a generous six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm going to take the unusual step, Presiding Officer, in not actually going to my own constituency in the first part of my uh, contribution this afternoon. Uh, however, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Alex Johnson on his continued informative education journey uh, that he has had uh, in getting evidence from this committee. <clears throat> I applaud Mr Johnson. Presiding officer, um, just before recess, I had the privilege <clears throat> of going to the Scottish Accessible Transport Alliance, AGM, to which I was asked to present awards. Uh, at the award ceremony, <clears throat> there was a community transport initiative, an initiative which has actually been going for the past 27 years. And some of us in this chamber will remember the Manpower Services Commission. And this transport initiative in Stirling, Falkirk and Clackmannan started with this Manpower Service Commission with two minibuses. They now have 27 buses and over 40 volunteers. They are successful, not in just the provision of a community transport, a lifeline to many people who are vulnerable and disabled, but they've actually taken an initiative, a step forward beyond community transport, and that is actually competing with the commercial transport as well. And from the profits from their commercial transport, the commercial bus service, they actually put those profits into the community transport initiative. I'm sure it's a, an initiative and service that the minister is familiar with, given <coughs> he, uh, <coughs> he's the constituency MSP <coughs> for <coughs> that area. Presiding officer, it has only happened because of the dedication of the volunteers within that community transport. And one in particular, a Duncan Hearsom, who's been there since the initial, from the very, very start of the, of the initiative in that area. I was privileged and proud to present that award to Duncan at the ceremony. And if we're looking for a model of good practice and a way ahead and how to meet the challenge of the difficulties and the hurdles of community transport, I would suggest that we look at the, <coughs> at the um, dial, -a, dial a journey service within that area. Of course, it's been mentioned, presiding officer, community transport, 
throughout, the, throughout Scotland is different things to different areas. And certainly in my own constituency of Aberdeenshire West, the A to B service is an essential lifeline for many. Why? It's because quite often there is no commercial transport to get people from their homes, perhaps into a hospital or shopping or leisure pursuits. Even when there is commercial transport, quite often a person with a disability is denied access to that transport. The vehicle itself may not be compatible with their need. But worse, presiding officer, constituents have informed me that they can be sitting in a bus stop in their wheelchair waiting to access a bus. The bus comes along and they're told, sorry, you can't get on. The space has been taken up by buggies or people are refusing to move. Therefore, we're sorry and they move on. A situation where it's totally unacceptable, totally unacceptable. We should never be able to pass a person in a wheelchair at a bus stop and say, sorry, you cannot come on this bus. The drivers probably had the training, and I'm sure Stagecoach have told me on more than one occasion all their drivers go through the disability awareness training. It's a pity they don't put it into practice sometimes. And this is the difference with community transport, because the dedication of the volunteers that provide the community transport service would never leave someone at the roadside. In fact, they go the extra mile, presiding officer. They don't just get the person uh, from their home and to the bus. They quite often wait for them whilst they do their shopping, whilst they go for a hospital appointment, whilst they go maybe to meet a friend, even for that just cup of coffee. Margaret McCullough mentioned the preventative spend initiative, and that is something we need to take cognizance nice of, presiding officer, because the benefit to those people who are disabled and to the people who are maybe elderly, that, not, that is the only lifeline they have to get out and about to maybe a somewhere different, to visit a friend, to visit a relative in hospital, to do something that otherwise they could not do for themselves. It doesn't always require a minibus. Quite often it is just a car, a car with a dedicated driver. And the shop mobility service <coughs> in my own area <coughs> in Aberdeen provide just such a service. But we've heard throughout the whole of Scotland, these initiatives and community transport and the, and the dedication of the volunteers. And that is the value, the real value of community transport. It's not to do how much it actually costs, it's how much is put in. And that is the value of the volunteers. That is something we probably can't quantify in terms of the real cost, the absolute cost, I don't know how to measure dedication. I don't. But what I do is I value it. And I know that everyone uh, that uses the community transport services in my own area and throughout Scotland value the commitment, the dedication of the volunteers. We need to try and ensure that community transport has a future. But to be, to be perfectly frank, presiding officer, some organisations need to be smarter. Sometimes there could be a similar service a few miles down the road. We need to be smarter in engaging those agencies together, getting them to come together, work together. There's no point in a patient transport service being at one end of the street picking up someone to go to the hospital and there's a community transport a car at the other end of the street going to the same hospital. That doesn't make sense. We need better coordination. We need better planning. But most of all, we probably need the commitment that I believe the Transport Minister has already given this afternoon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to the closing speeches. And I call on Alex Johnson. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, as I expected, this has been a very constructive debate. And while there are one or two points we may have disagreed on, uh, that's always a healthy sign. Uh, I think what I take from this is that there is genuine support right around this chamber for the community transport uh, groups that exist all around the country. Uh, I've always learned new things, and I can assure Dennis Robertson uh, that I don't expect to ever get to the stage in life where I feel I know everything, uh, and I think this has been a, a very educational debate for me. To quote some of the things that have been said uh, in this debate, uh, I have to pick out one or two key individuals who came up with some real strong comments that we should all remember. 
First of all, there was Duncan McNeill, who reminded us that the cost of community transport is actually insignificant compared with the cost of missed hospital appointments. And when you look at the cost of running our health service in Scotland today, it is obvious that that is the truth. And I think that's something that I will take out uh, and probably use in subsequent speeches myself, claiming it as my own, if nothing else. It was always also uh, pointed out by Jim Eady uh, in the same vein that perhaps one of the things we ought to be doing uh, is finding out more information about what it really does save us. Because in the long term, uh, if we have tough decisions to make about transport, especially the transport of the elderly and the disabled, then if we know what the real cost of community transport is and we can demonstrate how cost effective the service is, then there's an opportunity to invest to save and one that we should always be prepared to make. But the fact is that the significance in this whole debate it lies in the quality of the people that we met during this inquiry. I will not name names, but we met individuals from north, south, east and west throughout Scotland who had very different backgrounds, very different experiences, but all brought something to the discussion. We heard a moment ago the suggestion from Dennis Robertson that we could be smarter about the way we do this. Yes, we could be smarter about the way we run community transport, but I believe we have some very smart people involved in the sector already. And if we make the right effort to support these people in what they do, then they are capable of making decisions for us. And in fact, Maureen Watt suggested that there is perhaps uh, space in the community planning system to involve those who are running community transport organisations today. Uh, I would agree with her in principle. The concern is that I learned from this inquiry that those volunteers who are already running community transport initiatives have probably very little time to get involved in community planning as well. Uh, more's the pity. We also, during the course of this uh, debate, heard uh, at some length from Gordon MacDonald, a man who brings considerable knowledge and expertise of the buf bus industry into such a discussion. And I have to say I was surprised perhaps, but certainly pleased to discover that he and I agree on many of the key issues. Another uh, person who brought expertise that I wasn't actually aware of uh, until he told us today uh, was David Stewart. His involvement uh, with SCVO uh, brought him uh, close to the point where decisions were being made about how money was allocated for community transport issues uh, in 2005. And I'm glad that he was able to tell us about the tough decisions that were made then uh, and how we actually uh, formed the industry that we have today. We heard from Cameron Buchanan that uh, there are, of course, issues of isolation. Uh, and even in our cities, there are people who are not able to get the, the advantage of transport simply because they're not on the routes. We also heard from Elaine Murray at one point, who talked about the fact that concessionary fares are a, a good idea, yes, but if you don't happen to be on a bus route, then it doesn't matter whether you have concessionary fares or not if you can't get a bus. And that's where community transport comes in. That's where community transport can provide a service for those who are not on a bus route and not able to take advantage of the existing concessionary uh, fare system. Before I move on, there's one more quote, uh, and quite often things appear in debates uh, which are quite entertaining. And this one, uh, I would have laughed out loud had it not been for the fact that it was such a serious issue. And that was the irony that was highlighted by Joan McAlpin when she talked about visiting uh, a community transport group uh, and saying that they were applying for support to the postcode lottery. How ironic is that, given some of the things that have been said during the course of this debate? The big challenge that lies ahead of us is to get uh, Parliament and, of course, government lined up to achieve the objectives that we have set them in this report. I believe the Minister, in his opening remark, indicated that he has already understood what we've been saying in this report. Uh, I believe that government is already going in the right direction. 
I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity for government and parliament to take forward uh, a common theme, uh, one where we have a common understanding and a common set of priorities and ensure that we do allow the considerable amount of talent that we have in Scotland to get the limited resources necessary to achieve the massive objectives of which they are capable. Finally, uh, there's something, uh, I'm not actually aware of whose idea it was, but one of the clever things we did after this report was published was we had a post-publication round table uh, on the committee. We had a, a, a morning when we invited all the people that had given evidence to come forward and tell us what they thought of the report. That was something of a high-risk strategy because they may have told us it was rubbish. There were certainly weaknesses that were highlighted, but I think it was an opportunity for us to be uh, confident, having heard what people had to say after they'd read the report, that we had found the right areas that people were most concerned about. That's why I'm confident that in spite of the fact that we were not able to support everything that was suggested or brought to us, that those within the industry and those who represent the individuals who depend on community transport will believe that we heard what they had to say and that we intend to achieve all we can on their behalf. Excellent. Many thanks. I'll call on James Kelly. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I, I welcome the opportunity to close this afternoon's debate on behalf of the Labour Party. It's been a, a very interesting and informative debate. And like Maureen Watt, uh, I want to start by thanking the committee, uh, the clerks and the witnesses who have contributed to such a substantive report. There's no doubt that, you know, listening to the contributions of members uh, and reading the report, that community transport uh, plays a very valuable role uh, in Scotland's communities, and that will uh, continue to be the case, uh, predominantly because of the, the age profile of Scotland's population. As Mark Griffin correctly pointed out, uh, the over 65s uh, will increase by 21 per cent uh, between 2006 and 2016, and over 85s by 38 per cent. Uh, in that time period. Uh, and that does give us specific challenges. Uh, added to the fact, as Cameron Buchanan pointed out, that uh, a lot of uh, individuals and communities uh, feel isolated from the current bus, bus network. And Scotland's demographic means that we have a substantial number of rural communities. Uh, I think I'm also drawn by the fact... Sure, yes. Dennis Robertson. Hey, I, th I thank Mr Kelly. Uh, it's, it's not just the fact that people are in isolation. It's sometimes the fact that uh, people are slightly wary of using a, a commercial transport because they don't know what the service they're actually going to get, even if they could ex access it in the first place. Mr Kelly. I think, that, I think that's very true, and I think that, that sort of brings me on to my next point and reiterates why 16% uh, of the users of community transport are, are disabled people. And that's probably because they're a bit wary of the, the commercial network and what they're, they're going into there. Elaine Murray pointed out to us, you know, the extent and the range uh, of community transport. It's not just buses, it can be uh, mini buses and also uh, taxis. And Margaret McCulloch quite correctly identified what a lifeline they provide uh, to many communities throughout Scotland. Part of the, the committee's uh, you know, work was looking at the funding challenges. Uh, and there's no doubt that the, you know, the, the decision by the SNP government uh, in 2007-2008 to uh, collapse ring, fi ring fencing uh, has presented challenges in terms of money which has then been available to community transport. And it strikes me that, um, you know, the minister is somewhat, you know, wrings his hands, you know, when he looks at what, what's happening here. There's no doubt that there is, uh, there's quite a degree of differences uh, across the country, and it's a, a direct result of the collapse and of ring, ring fence. And sure, I'll give way to the minister. Uh, 
Keith Brown. Thank the member for taking intervention. Also, ask whether the comments he has just made suggest that he would support the reintroduction of ring fencing in this regard. And also, if not, does he think that we should then put more money in to support those local authorities who have invested less than other local authorities in community transport? James Kelly. I'm not supporting the, the reintroduction of ring fencing, but what I'm saying, Minister, is that your attitude seems to be you're a bit like one of the passengers on the bus. As the bus drives along, you're looking outside and saying, oh, look what's happened there. Mm, there's not really much I can do about that. You need to show a bit of innovation and a bit of leadership, I would suggest. And to give you a practical suggestion, you know, one of the things that uh, witnesses to the committee uh, to, witness told, witnesses told the committee was that the change fund wasn't being used properly and people weren't aware of the change fund. Perhaps you could look at how that you know, could be maybe extended or even used you know, with, with more information becoming available in order to uh, get funding to those community transport organisations uh, that need them. I think one of the other issues that was identified in a very comprehensive speech by Gordon MacDonald was that of the need for asset replacement uh, and the challenges that the asset base of the community transport fleet uh, face. You know, and if, uh, if the assets are not being replaced timely, then maintenance costs begin to run up. And some members highlighted issues, including Joan McAlpine, where uh, many buses had broken down during the course of journeys. So I think uh, I do welcome the fact that the Minister and the Government are going to look at the issue of uh, asset replacement. I also think that more certainty around funding uh, would be helpful, and I agree with Alec Johnson's suggestion that we should look at uh, multi-year funding. I think a number of members, including uh, Roderick Campbell and Dennis Robertson, uh, rightly praised the work uh, of volunteers, and it's clear that there are challenges for volunteers around the uh, license arrangements and I think uh, in terms of training of many bus drivers uh, uh, those that are on these licenses I think more can be done to look at to, to see how we could uh, coordinate and join up training better in order that we save costs for voluntary organizations but I do think that you know any discussion uh, about community transport cannot take place in isolation we need to look at what is happening in, in, in terms of buses generally. And the reality is that the cuts that the government have made to the bus service operators grant and also the changes that they're making in terms of reimbursement to the concessionary travel scheme, which will be reduced to 58% next year, mean that we have less bus routes and less buses throughout Scotland. There's a 12.5% reduction in annual mileage since 2008, and that means we don't have as many buses uh, entering uh, our communities, and that puts more pressure on the community transport organisations. So the government could quite, quite simply can't look at this in isolation. They need to look at their record on, on buses generally, uh, and buses are being underfunded and Passengers have been left uh, at bus stops without bus routes to service them. I think in terms of the, the work that the committee have done, they've made a number of very practical suggestions and they've informed us all in terms of the debate. Uh, and I look forward to see how some of those suggestions will be taken forward. Excellent. Many thanks. Now call on Minister Keith Brown. Ten minutes, please, or thereby. Thank you very much, President Officer. I've listened with interest to the contributions, which, although they've been diverse, have largely been uh, consensual, and there is a degree of consensus on this issue, as has been mentioned by previous speakers. I had hoped to say that uh, James Kelly's speech was absolutely smashing, but um, as his subsequent comments have proven, uh, I think it's quite clear from the, the, the comments he's made about the Scottish Government proves he's a, a glass half-empty kind of guy, in fact, a glass completely empty. Uh, and just to say on some of the points that he's made, he's talked about wringing our hands. Well, the very essence of wringing your hands is to complain about the effects of dropping ring fencing at the same time as not proposing to reintroduce it. Or similarly, in relation to the rate of reimbursement, if you disagree with the rate of reimbursement, which has been independently arrived at and jointly agreed with the bus industry, then it's perfectly open to yourself to propose during the budget there should be a different rate of reimbursement. And I look forward to seeing that uh, if you have the conviction to bring that forward. 
I think, though, to try and concentrate on some of the points of consensus, I think there's a, a large degree of recognition of the value of the contribution made by the community transport sector. I'm also aware that the uh, transport sector has been described by many members as being particularly diverse. It's got no predetermined shape, but it does spring from local communities working together to meet the transport needs in a particular uh, way. And I think to uh, probably endorse the comments made by Alec Johnson, it does not want, nor does it need, a centrally driven agenda. But in tough economic times, I acknowledge it could benefit from some further help. And because of this, the Scottish Government will be working with the CTA and other stakeholders to strengthen the support that we provide. If I can come back on one or two of the points raised by individual members, firstly to Rod Campbell, perhaps didn't quite understand the import of his question when he asked it, but just to confirm that the Scottish Government does not accept that a failure to provide a concessionary travel scheme covering community transport is in any way uh, unlawful under uh, community, uh, sorry, equi equality law. Um, to come back to a point made by uh, Duncan McNeill, uh, just to say that the Scottish Government uh, in providing, is providing around £400,000 uh, over two years for at least two pilots, one urban and one rural, uh, in relation to healthcare transport. And we will be seeking applications from NHS boards as the lead uh, authority, but acting in collaboration with relevant local authorities, regional transport partnerships and the Scottish Ambulance Service. Uh, and these pilots will explore, as he suggested, new approaches to provision uh, and integration of health and social care transport. So that it is being taken forward and I take on board the points that he raised. Uh, also the point, uh, one point I, I took out from the comments of uh, Cameron Buchanan was the suggestion made in his area that uh, we should try and simplify the applications for BSOG. Uh, if he wants to write to me further on that, exactly what the modifications are that are being proposed, which would be helpful to uh, operators, then I'm more than willing to have officials uh, look at that and get back to him uh, on that. Um, in relation to uh, Alec Johnson's comments again about one-year funding, I think there is uh, it's something we've all heard before many times from different uh, uh, authorities, and especially in the third sector. But I would say, as well as the fact that that could be a charge levelled at local government or the Scottish government, we're currently in the process of a one-year spending review from Westminster. Much flows from that. What we do flows from that, obviously, under the current situation, and what we do uh, also influences what local authorities do. So I think there has to be a joint approach if we are to give them a longer-term, more stable funding, which has been uh, mentioned. Can I say that Mark Griffin, I think, made many of us very envious when he said, uh, when he mentioned himself and being one of the people that sat his test after 1997. And I'm very grateful he didn't say how long after 1997 it was that he sat his test. Uh, and I must say, I could have sat my test uh, when I was 17, gone back to zero, and then sat it again before 1997. Um, so very envious of that. But he makes a very important point, that point about people having qualified to drive after that period, not being able to uh, drive minibuses. Uh, and we will uh, look at that. I've mentioned some of the measures that we're already saying that we should take in relation to the general issue of making sure we have enough trained people, qualified people to undertake driving on a voluntary basis. We shouldn't be uh, putting obstacles in the way. We should try to make it as easy as possible. I just say to Elaine Murray, she's made the point about the concessionary travel scheme and saying that she, the situation she finds herself in would make it uh, wrong for her to benefit from free concessionary travel. And that's the difference between us. And I think it's a, a sincere point. And I know she's frustrated at the reaction that she gets. And can I just explain that for many people in the SNP, we've gone through so many elections, been told that we are about to cut the concessionary travel scheme. And that perhaps explains some of the sensitivity around that area. But she's, of course, quite right to say these debates are times to put forward contentious things uh, and to put forward a point of view. And I, I don't uh, disagree with that at all. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was that made the point about procurement uh, and trying to use the procurement powers of local authorities and the Scottish Government to make it uh, easier for uh, community transport organisations to procure, for example, um, new buses. Uh, and I think that's uh, a very important point. And I have looked into this in some detail. One of the things I was very keen to do was if the Scottish Government was able to help out with the provision of new assets, that we did so on the basis, as we're doing with the Green Bus Fund, of buying uh, vehicles which are much more environmentally friendly. And I think when you do look into this, you'll find that there's, there's very few, none, on the market which achieve that to any extent. There's no question that even buying new um, buses, they will be more environmentally friendly than the ones that they're placing. I understand that point. But the ones that we've had uh, for the general bus fund 
of course, have in many cases been hybrids, and they're much more environmentally friendly. And I, I did look into this with Alexander Dennis. They say they would have to have around two to 300 uh, on order to make it viable for them to develop a bus of that kind. And I think if we can do, as has been suggested, try and work together with local authorities and the Scottish Government, if we can start to give that certainty of orders to some of the suppliers, then it's possible that we could uh, achieve even more of that. That will not stand in the way, though, of the point that I've made before as coming to a conclusion very quickly on what support we can give uh, through a grant scheme to help uh, some operators uh, replace uh, their, their vehicles currently. Uh, I should come back on the point which Mark Griffin raised around the level of funding for local government. I asked for the figures in 2006-07, it was around 34.7% of Scottish government expenditure. It currently sits at 38%. It's been above 37% for every year in between. I think that speaks to the commitment we've made uh, to uh, local authorities. Yes, I will do. James Kelly. And in the two preceding years, last year, more than 50% of the cuts passed down from Westminster were passed on to local government. In the preceding year, more than 80% of those cuts. So local government has actually been penalised under the SNP government. Minister. Yeah, I think those figures completely contradict the point I first made. Is the cuts that we've had around 6.4%, uh, and the, sorry, the increase that we've had is 6.4%. The increase for local government, 8.9%. It's not possible to square that with the allegation that's been cuts being passed on to local government to the extent he said. So I think he's just wrong on that. Can I mention also, Dennis Robertson mentioned, and I'm very grateful that he did, uh, Duncan Pearson within my own constituency for the work that he's done and the award that was made. Can I also just very quickly mention Kathleen Welsh, who was uh, a woman with um, substantial disabilities in my constituency. I've represented her both as a councillor and MSP now for uh, the best part of 17 years. And she died recently, uh, a few weeks ago, but she had worked tirelessly with Dial Journey for many years to help people uh, access those kind of services. And it's a real loss to the sector that she uh, has died. I'd want to record my thanks to her for what she's done. I can also just say that uh, to reiterate the points that we made at the start about what we are doing, because I think James Kelly mentioned the idea of leadership. Well, we do believe we're providing leadership in relation to providing the research which has been talked, to, uh, talked about in terms of the community transport sector, in terms of providing an improvement to support and provision of advice to the sector, in terms of a doubling of the monies which are made payable to CTA, uh, which allow them to do some of the things which many members have talked about in terms of getting a better database of information as to how we go forward, and also what we might still be able to do in terms of uh, bus investment in relation to a grant scheme. So I think there's a great deal that is being done by the Scottish Government. I do believe we are showing leadership. I think the committee by and large agreed it was a positive response to the very important points which the committee had provided and we've tried to do that. Uh, the new bus investment fund which I've mentioned has already seen a number of community transport projects submitting big bids for funding in its first year and I'm hopeful as I've said that these will be successful. We have shifted the basis for BSOG to mileage rather than fuel used which just seems to make sense to me. I think it was to some extent opposed at the time, but it's worked out extremely well. I think we were right to do that. It's tended to benefit operators, uh, especially those in more uh, rural environments. So I think there's a great deal that is positive in this debate, uh, uh, presiding officer, and I think it's, it's good to see the level of, uh, of consensus that has emerged. The one thing I'd like to see, if it was possible to get absolute uh, unanimous uh, consensus on, was Duncan McNeill's point when he talked about the, the jungle of uh, anagrams and so on, uh, uh, or a uh, Think things like ICI, he mentioned the name from the past, uh, and the SAS, although it was the Scottish Ambulance Service rather than anything else that he mentioned. But he also did say as well that I shouldn't be categorised with Jim Hacker, who was alleged to, by Sir Humphrey to have been uh, unable to tell his ACAS from his NALGO. And I'm glad that I'm not categorised in that way as an ex-shop steward uh, and member of uh, NALGO. But I think it's generally been a very positive debate, and I think that it's important that we take forward the lessons which have been made, both in terms of the comments made today by members, but also by the committee. We have responded to a number of the requests that we've made. We've not finished at that point. I think there is more that we can do, and I undertake on behalf of the Scottish Government to do just that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Adam Ingram to wind up the debate. Uh, Mr Ingram, if you could continue to about 4.59 to or thereabouts, it would be helpful. OK, well, I, I, I'll endeavour to do that, uh, Presiding Officer. And I'm very pleased to wind up what has been a constructive debate on behalf of the committee. It's clear that there is and has been cross-party support for most of the committee's findings 
and the recommendations made to the Scottish Government. There is an obvious recognition of the valuable role which community transport plays in the lives of service users and the importance of providing support to those volunteering or working in the sector in keeping these lifeline services running, especially in the context of rising demand from an ageing population, as Maureen Watt uh, highlighted in her initial contribution. Now, turning to the key issues, many members emphasise that greater security and reliability of funding, which provides an ability to plan for the future, is vital to assure the future of the community transport sector in Scotland. Inconsistency of funding, regardless of where it comes from, is one of the biggest <laughs> burdens on the sector and also one of the greatest drains on its resources. Greater funding security would allow operators to focus their energies on the job of providing and developing these services. And I thought uh, Gordon MacDonald made a particular, uh, uh, particularly effective contribution, uh, especially with regards to the three years funding, uh, uh, replacing the one year system uh, that we tend to have at the moment, as did Joan McAlpine when she highlighted the burden on the very small operators of the, the admin and the bureaucracy involved. And this, again, was raised with me directly by uh, the Coalfield Community Transport, which Elaine Murray mentioned in her, that she had visited during the course of the, the committee's uh, inquiry. Local authorities clearly have difficult decisions to make about funding priorities for their areas, but questions have to be raised about the very obvious variability of funding for the community transport sector across Scotland when, as has been made clear, so many of the same problems of access to transport exist across the length and breadth of the country. The Scottish Government's consideration of a grant scheme for replacement vehicles is to be commended and may go some considerable way towards allowing operators to plan for the future of their services with greater confidence. And we can look forward to an update from the Scottish Government on these plans. Now, as members will know, community transport organisations tend to develop organically arising in response to the perceived local need. Operators and volunteers' commitment to meeting these needs are to be strongly commended, and Dennis Robertson made a particularly uh, notable contribution, uh, highlighting some uh, 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 operations in the minister's own constituency during the course of, of Dennis's speech. But the risk, as the committee has heard, is that groups emerging in isolation can lack the guidance and resources to enable them to meet their full potential. However, there are people in the sector with the knowledge and background to support these often very small groups and to provide sectoral leadership. The last thing the committee would want is the community emphasis of these transport groups to be lost. And so it was felt that a, a national strategy approach would be inappropriate here. Now, the Community Transport Association in Scotland has been widely acknowledged as the sector experts for Scotland. And the committee knows from its evidence taking that operators in Scotland depend heavily on CTA Scotland's advice and guidance. And it was on that basis that the committee recommended that the Scottish Government support them in taking on an expanded role. And I very much welcome uh, the Minister, as will the committee members, the Minister's announcement of doubling the funding uh, support for the CTA on an annual basis. This will help the sector develop a shared vision and perhaps more importantly, shared standards of service whilst importantly remaining responsive to specific local needs and circumstances. 
Now, the CTA produced in 2012 a State of the Sector report for Scotland, which was an interesting and illustrative snapshot of community transport provision in Scotland. However, as the report acknowledged, this was by no means comprehensive, and there are many gaps in the data. And it's not just in terms of quantitative information, like the number of services where they exist, or how many journeys they provide. It's also the qualitative issues which need to be fully understood. There is a need to establish beyond anecdotal evidence the impact which community transport has on the health, social engagement and welfare of service users and the wider impacts this can have on the community and public services. A deeper understanding of the sector is needed in both Rod Campbell and Maureen McCulloch emphasised this point in their contributions. And in its response the Scot to the committee's recommendations, the Scottish Government stated that it proposes to commission a new piece of qualitative research to collect information from a selection of community transport providers in Scotland on their services, including benefits and costs, and to deepen its understanding of what services are currently available. And again, that's something we'll look forward to getting some feedback from the government on in due course. On driver licensing, as many members also highlighted, the challenges to the community transport associated with driver licensing and the cost thereof are already significant and growing year on year. There is no easy solution in so much as the changes to minibus, minibus driver licensing were brought about by changes in European regulations and the pool of people who can drive minibuses without having to obtain a specific license qualification is ever decreasing. The cost associated with training an individual to obtain the necessary license, as the committee heard in evidence, can be quite significant especially for transport providers for whom 800 to 1,000 pounds represent a significant impact upon available resources. In evidence, the minister said that it would be possible for the government to provide support to reduce the cost to organisations. And the committee welcomed the willingness of the Scottish government to look at this and recommended that training coordination be looked at in the context of developing a wider means of support for community transport in Scotland. And in its response, the Scottish Government agreed to explore with uh, the CTA, community transport groups, other minibus operators, including local authorities and training providers, future demand for D1 qualified drivers and, in the light of this, options for securing D1 training more efficiently. Uh, and this was an issue uh, uh, that was raised with me again by my uh, local coalfield community transport provider in Cumnock who suggested they would make very fine trainers for uh, uh, other community transport providers. Uh, on joint working, it was very encouraging to see throughout the committee's own evidence taking and in the evidence heard by the Health and Sport Committee that there are good examples of joint working between community transport groups and partnership agencies in Scotland. Indeed, the benefits of doing so have already been highlighted in high-level reports by Audit Scotland and by the Scottish Government's uh, own Short Life Working Group on Transport for health Healthcare. Duncan uh, McNeill made a particularly uh, effective contribution in this whole area during today's debate. And the Scottish Government has indicated that it will continue to work with regional transport partnerships and NHS Scotland to implement the recommendations of the Short Life Working Group, which are, are la largely echoed by the Committee's own recommendations. Now, as we have heard uh, over the course of the afternoon, uh, perhaps the most hotly debated aspect of the Committee's report is on concession of travel. Um, and there is a consensus that there exists an inequity 
experienced by those who, although entitled to concessionary travel, cannot access the forms of transport to which this concessionary scheme applies. And uh, we had a good going argument between Jim Edie, Elaine Murray, Alec Johnson and Cameron Buchanan this afternoon, which gave a flavour of, of, of the issues involved. But there's no doubt, as I said, people are, uh, certain people can find it uh, difficult to access service, so difficult to walk, walk to a bus stop or they live in an isolated or rural area with no bus services. And for these individuals, if they lack access to public transport or a car, the choice is between community transport and taxis, neither of which is free. Age Scotland's still waiting campaign has done a good job of bringing to the attention of members and the wider public the consequences of isolation on Scotland's elderly and disabled population as a result of a lack of transport. The campaign has called for an extension of the concessionary travel scheme to all community transport schemes. And this, on the surface, would appear to be a simple and natural solution. You can bring your remarks to close any time now, Mr Ingram. All oh, right, OK. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, but as the committee heard during the course of, of its uh, uh, evidence taking, the issue is significantly more complex. And we've recommended that the Scottish Government come up with alternative appropriate uh, means but to address the inequities here. So in conclusion, Presiding Officer, I thank my colleagues for their contributions and hope that the Parliament has found our report to be a useful contribution to the wider debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Ingram, for your cooperation. That concludes the debate on the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee's inquiry into community transport. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 8093 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 8093. Formally moved, Presiding Officer. No member has asked to speak against the motion, so I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 8093, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 8091 on approval of an SSI. Moved. The question on this motion will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are two questions to put as a result of today's business. The first question is at motion number 8079, in the name of Maureen Watt, on the inquiry into community transport, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 8091, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on approval of an SSI, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Any members who are leaving the chamber, please do so quickly and quietly.